Now the sides were turned, and all of the advantages seemed to fall to the Russians. The Germans, in bewilderment and despair, were thrown back 10 miles, 20, 50, 100, 200 miles. Hitler alone saved his army. His generals, in panic, wanted to retreat. Hitler, in fear and towering rage, ordered them to stay and fight to whatever the end might be. There would be no Napoleonic running away to death and defeat this time. Any general who could not or would not obey was brought home in disgrace. Among them, the brilliant tank commanders, Hüpfner and Guderian. This was the Russian-German War. In their tracks, the Germans left evidence of their ruthless treatment of anyone who tried to stop them. The frozen bodies of partisans twisting like puppets in the cold wind. No Russian gave a care for those Germans who puked out their Christmas dinner of frozen horse meat or froze to death while squatting in the snow to relieve themselves. By the new year, Berlin was counting the cost. 800,000 men lost, 200,000 of them killed, and Russian losses they had passed the limits of imagination. Five or six million killed, wounded, captured, missing. The Germans had entered Russia with the best equipped army in history. Now they were reduced to pathetic attempts to keep themselves warm. Crude mittens of cheap cotton. Elephantine boots woven of straw. It was the worst winter in 140 years. The great counteroffensive, which had begun so well, slowed down, then stopped forever. The Germans stayed and fought with skill and tenacity. Once again, Hitler had shown more confidence in them than they felt themselves, and he was still the unquestioned leader of these men condemned to the Eastern Front. The winter compounded the agony of the supply lines. Men ate frozen horse flesh because the trucks couldn't reach them. Panzers sat useless, their tanks dry, their guns cold because the trucks couldn't reach them. What is more, in their lightning sweep through this country, the Germans left behind them tens of thousands of uncaptured Russian soldiers. These men began to organize themselves into pocket armies and do real damage to the supply lines. drama of the defense of Moscow and the counteroffensive. No one had time to hear the story of the hell on earth that Leningrad was living through. The three million people of the city had been trapped and surrounded since the end of August 
The Finns to the north, the Germans to the south. They had been bombed and shelled and attacked relentlessly, perpetually, unmercifully, day and night. And they wouldn't give up. Teenage girls labored at the Kirov works to produce ammunition for the men in the trenches around the city. These trenches, nearly 16,000 miles of them, had been dug by women, mostly. Old men and women built the 17,000 firing points and 4,000 pillboxes in the homes of the city. This place would not be taken without a flood tide of blood. A battle which would match in horror anything the world had ever seen. Hitler's hatred of the city grew with every day. He ordered that it be smashed and leveled to the ground, that no one be allowed to give up, its people to be shot or starved or driven out. The bombs and shells set the blood flowing, but they failed to break the will of these people. There was death, death everywhere. Mothers and fathers, the old men in the trenches, the young girls in the Kirov works, and the children. Most of all, the children. Marshal Zhukov saved Leningrad, saved it before he saved Moscow. He drove the people of the city, drove them in the worst hours, drove them until they felt a numb will to survive. His orders were simple and brutal. Do as I say or I will have you shot. They responded to his orders. They learned to take the bombs and shells. And they helplessly accepted the slow, excruciating pain of starvation. There was one way into Leningrad and one way only. Across Lake Ladoga to the northeast. A hundred mile ice road was built and the convoys began to roll and the food began to trickle in. Day and night the trucks rumbled on and day and night the Germans showered them with explosives. Men went on careless of their own lives. All over Russia the same phenomenon. Individual life was not precious just so long as there was a Russia and Russians, and always would be. It was a response incomprehensible to the Western mind. Whatever food got through, it was not enough, never enough. walked around in the hallucinatory days of advanced hunger. There were rations, a single slice of bread per person, but people tried to still their agony by boiling their leather coats and gloves and eating them. They ate jellied sheep guts. They stripped the paper from the walls and boiled the glue out of it and they ate that. They tore open their medicine cabinets and ate the Vaseline and drank the hair oil. They stooped to animal things and they cheated death day by day and with some dignity, they lived a little longer. At last, a rail link was established on the other side of the frozen lake, and some were evacuated. The city survived nearly 900 days of this strangulation before the German hold was broken and Leningrad was relieved. In this testament to the limits of the human will to live, The gun was big enough to have a name, Dora. The Germans built it to shell the Maginot Line. It was not needed there, and now it was being brought up to level Sevastopol. In the summer of 1942, the Germans had recovered from their first winter and were busy reversing the Russian advances. 
Two important cities, Kersh and Kharkov, had been taken. And now it was the turn of Sebastopol. On the face of it, the city was a flaming ruin, with buildings collapsing minute by minute in the bombardment. Like Leningrad, a whole continent to the north, it was surrounded and had been for more than 200 days. But unlike the people of Leningrad, these people survived not in the ruins, but under them, under the raging inferno, in enormous caves dug in the rock. Time after time, the Germans threw themselves at the defenses, and each time, the city would not fall. The shifting fortunes of war kept the diplomats as busy as generals. The United States, Britain and Canada had promised Russia every tank, gun and truck they could spare. The Americans in particular had tipped their great industrial cornucopia of Russia's way. But not much had flowed from it yet. It would take time. The Russians were anxious and understandably impatient. There were more signings of more agreements. Hitler was having trouble with his ally, Finland. The Finns had never embraced the Nazis. They did not want to conquer Russia. They only wanted back the land which they felt was rightfully theirs. Finland had a half million good men in her army. So good, in fact, the Finns complained that the SS troops Germany had sent her were not up to standard and had no stomach for a fight. Hitler needed the Finns badly, and even in the face of this humiliating criticism, he had to play sweet. Finland had lost her enthusiasm for the war, and there was growing pressure on her to drop out. Hitler reached for the Caucasus and beyond their snowy peaks, for the Russian oil fields as far south and east as Baku on the Caspian Sea. Before winter came again, the Germans would be another 700 miles deeper into Russian territory. In these men, you could see the changing face of the German army. It was becoming less and less German. Virtually all of the fresh troops coming into Russia were Romanian, Hungarian, Italian. Even the SS was turning France, Belgium, Holland, Scandinavia upside down in search of their special breed of man. One third of the German army in Russia, 52 divisions, was now non-German. Hitler pulled troops away from the armies in front of Moscow and Leningrad to make his push here. The most spectacular German successes had been in the south, and he was obviously determined to build on success. At last, the great convoys were beginning to make their way through from the arsenals of the west. Before the war was over, the Americans, British, and Canadians would send the Russians 12,000 airplanes, 10,000 tanks, 210,000 cars, 427,000 trucks. They would march in American boots and eat tin spam until they knew almost no other taste but tin spam. They would never like the tanks they were sent. They could and did make more and better of their own, but the trucks were a godsend. Russia had no auto industry, and without these valuable vehicles, she could not supply swiftly moving armies in pursuit of the Germans. But the Russians would not be eternally grateful. All the spam in the world could not pay for the lives of the millions who were dying to stop this man, Hitler. All through that long, hot, dusty summer, the Germans went on in the same depressing, relentless, infinite routine. You could march on as far as your legs would carry you today, only to march the same distance tomorrow. To get where? Nowhere. Often they ran out of gasoline. Frequently there was no food.
the features of the men they fought began to change. Now they were true Asians. Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Bashkirs, Kirkis, Volga Tatars. They captured oil fields only to gaze in despair at what the Russians had done to them. It would take months of German skill and industry before they would be of use to anyone. Behind them, in the mountains, they left thousands of these strange Asian people uncaptured. They now organized as partisans and would hurt the Germans every day they stayed here. Once again, Hitler made the same fatal error, ignored the lesson he never learned. He split his forces and halved his strength. He would not only storm the Caucasus, but would also take Stalingrad on the Volga, head on. What could Stalingrad mean to him? A year's supply of oil had already gone up the Volga. The city was an industrial fortress. The river and the rail lines to Moscow could be cut much easier if he attacked farther south. Perhaps his only reasoning was the name of the city itself, Stalingrad. The city got it first from the air. The Luftwaffe rained out every bomb the Germans could carry into Russia. On the very first day, 40,000 people died in a horrible, fiery sea of incendiary bombs. Never had the Blitzkrieg worked so terrifyingly, so efficiently. The bombs, the bombers, the Stukas, the guns, the shells, the tanks. The men with the machine guns and the flamethrowers. Stalingrad burned away to a skeletal shell of roofless walls and rubble. The survivors fled, leaving the stage set for one of the worst horror stories in the whole long history of human misbehavior. For 80 days and 80 nights, a mincer, a meat grinder, a slaughterhouse, one against one, one on one. God give me the luck to spill your guts before you spill mine. Along the rat runs, up from the sewers, down from the attics. The sound, the noise, madness, screaming madness. Every man of deadly aim stalking. Standartenfuhrer Heinz Torvald, master German sniper. Got him, dead. days fighting over one house. 54 German corpses in the cellar, on the stairs. In the bowels of hell, terrifying, puking fear. Days in the tractor factory, the foundry. German snipers behind the lathes, Russian machine gunners in the blast furnaces. A few more men across the frozen river to stuff the German mincer to keep it busy. The Luftwaffe flew in more ammunition for the insatiable guns and then flew out the wounded. There was no room for the dead. They were simply pickaxed into the frozen soil of Russia. This was the glorious Sixth Army, the biggest army in Russia, the best army in Russia, the men who took Paris in six weeks. All 20 magnificent divisions now burned out, exhausted. But there was no sense of defeat the Russians were fanatical, but they were driven back on the Volga and they were dying, every one of them. And then Zhukov opened his deadly bag of tricks and out came another surprise army of a million men, heaving in through the Italians and the Romanians on the weak sides of the German army. 
In four days, the two arms of the trap touched, closed, and the Germans were surrounded. Racing through the snow, stumbling, falling into each other's arms, the Russians shouted and cried like children. Hitler refused surrender. He refused any attempt to break out of the trap. The Russians drew the noose tighter and tighter. The Germans froze and starved and committed suicide and died fanatically, defending useless, broken piles of brick. And then it was over. 24 generals and 91,000 men. All that remained of the 285,000 who had come to capture Stalingrad for no good reason. Hitler had made General von Paulus a field marshal the day before and had reminded him that no German field marshal had ever surrendered in battle. Von Paulus was the first. Once again, the whole psychology of the war was turned round. It was possible to think that Germany might lose. You could see this heresy undisguised in the despairing face of the new field marshal, Friedrich von Paulus.